So as both nations uh, in Europe, uh, England, Spain, France, all of these nations in Europe, finding this untamed, untapped land, eventually uh, what would happen is that each nation would have to claim uh, territories. So what will happen uh, at around the 1500s, early 1500s, is that each nation in Europe will claim a section of the New World. So colonizing the New World. Uh, as you can see from this map, the uh, Russia, even Russia, but bed for territory, Great Britain, and this is probably like 1700s uh, because uh, the uh, Canadian region of uh, Canada, well, ca uh, Canadian region of North America was at one time controlled by the blue, which was the French, uh, but then given to the British uh, after the French and Indian War, which we'll talk about once we get to that section. And as you can see, Portugal and Spain, mainly Spain, controls most of the New World. The year is 1519. The Spanish have complete control over the Americas. The goal was to show their rivals that land uh, that the land in the New World was theirs in the form of colonies. In 1519, though, it was about exploring their new holdings. So they sent Hernan Cortez to explore the Yucatan Peninsula. The reports that were coming out of this new land was that the land was vast, had vast riches. Remember that the conquistadors or conquerors, lived for three things. God, glory, and gold. When they landed in the peninsula, uh, they were met by one of the region's greatest empires, the Aztecs. In 1521, Cortes united the enemies of the Aztecs and destroyed the Aztec city of Tolintecan. And uh, I apologize for butchering that name. Uh, Tolintecan the great city of the Aztecs. And to add insult to injury, Cortes and his men erected what is now known as Mexico City on the ruins of the Aztec city. Thus the capital of New Spain was created and from Mexico City the conquistadors conquered more lands. Unfortunately, the, uh, the Spanish brought over diseases. And this made it easy for the Spanish uh, because it either wiped out entire tribes or weakened Native American tribes uh, so that they couldn't fight back. Soon, however, Spain controlled territory that stretched from modern-day Florida to uh, what is now most of Central and South America. So basically this map. As you can see, uh, this is a map of basically territories of the New World, uh, eventually the United States, as you can see here. But you have Spain uh, controlling most of the North America, Central, and of course, as you saw from the map before, South America. Spain was not the only country that came to America, however. All right, France, Spain, uh, Spain's rival and enemy also began exploring, particularly North America. In the early 1500s, Jacques Cater and Giovanni de Verrazzano funded many trips. In 1602, the French king, Henry IV, authorized a group of French merchants to establish a colony in what is now known as Canada. In 1608, Samuel de Chaplin, or Chaplin, Chaplin, something like that, founded Quebec and, the eventually, and eventually which would become the capital of New France. 
By the late 1600s, the French began exploring areas along the Gulf of Mexico. Eventually, René Robert Calvert de La Salle founded and claimed a region that he would call Louisiana. Other territorial claims would then follow, but for the most part, most of the French will stay in Canada. They will, and unlike their Spanish and English brethren who are coming over to North America, they're actually going to treat the Native American peoples of their region a little better. They're going to learn uh, their languages, they're going to learn their uh, cultures, and eventually, you know, really set up a strong foundation for these two peoples. Obviously, obviously the most uh, well-known colony of the New World is the 13 colonies. This is the one that primarily in schools uh, we talk about. So while the French were exploring Canada and parts of North America along the Mississippi River, England was exploring the east coast of America. And so basically the 13 colonies, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut, New York, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Delaware, Maryland, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia will be established later on. Primarily the first colony to be established will be uh, Virginia. So in the late 1600s, the English set up their first colony, which they dubbed Roanoke. Uh, unfortunately for the English, their first attempt to colonize the New World didn't go as planned. Uh, the colony disappeared uh, completely without a trace. Uh, when the colonist founder or the colony's founder returned from England, because what happened is that he leaves to go get supplies, bring supplies back. Unfortunately, England winds up in a war with the French and uh, cannot leave, and so he cannot leave, or was, no, excuse me, the war with, the, uh, with Spain, and he cannot leave. Uh, and so it takes uh, a few years before he actually returns. When he uh, finally returns from England after this ro uh, war, all that he finds uh, and the people that are with him, all that th they can find is a single word in this picture, as you can see here, this is, here's the fan, you know, Sir Walter Raleigh. Uh, when he returns uh, with all these people, all that they find it carved in a tree is a word called Croatoan. Um, Croatoan, actually, uh, there's several different theories of why it disappeared. One theory is that, uh, uh, that historians and archaeologists are, uh, have said is that the n neighboring Indian tribe wiped them out. Okay, that's one of the theories. Another theory is that one of the other tribes took them in and, because the colonists were starving and the colonists adopted the tribe's name, uh, just became part of the tribe, and to let Sir Walter Raleigh know uh, where they had went, they carved Croatoan into the tree. Uh, but again, to this day, historians and archaeologists, like I said, have theories about what happened to Roanoke, but there is no evidence uh, to prove. Uh, there, we're still combing through the evidence to find proof as to what really happened to Roanoke. It's one of history's great mysteries. Uh, now, for the English, you would think that this would probably just stop them from completing their task of colonizing. Uh, the New World, but their rivals of Spain and France uh, are doing it, so if they don't do it, they lose power, lose trade, lose face, and so they try again, this time in 1607. Uh, in 1607, the British once again try to settle in the New World. This time, they set up the town known as Jamestown. Most everybody knows this story, or you have seen the Disney movie. I'm sorry, but the Disney movie is fake. Nothing, ha nothing like that happened. John, John Smith, I'm sorry to tell you, 
was not blonde hair, blue eyes. Uh, he was actually one of the most unattractive men possible. And Pocahontas did not marry him. Yes, there was a real Pocahontas, though. But he did not marry him. I'm sorry. If I crushed anybody's, you know, Disney dreams. Uh, Pocahontas? Yes, Pocahontas married uh, another man uh, later on. Uh, and she was about 13. Uh, and uh, died when she went to England with her husband uh, of smallpox. So, uh, it was a very tragic love story. Uh, so, uh, to set that straight, uh, let's get back to the story. So, at the start of the settlement, the colony was uh, not prepared. Uh, most of the British colonists that arrived in Jamestown didn't know how to uh, find food for themselves. They did not. They a lot of them didn't know how to hunt. They were poorly educated. Many of them were actually criminals who were given the choice: uh, here, go to Jamestown and become a colonist or rot in jail. Uh, I would be one who would say, okay, I'm going to Jamestown. Uh, but, uh, so we have a lot of, you know, unsavory elements. Some are coming to the new world to pay off their debts. Some are coming to the new world because they, uh, they uh, hear the stories of a better life. Um, but so a lot of them are not, you know, very well educated, don't know how to farm, don't know how to survive on their own. Unfortunately, the land that they settled is not very good. Uh, it is not good for farming, particularly. So the colonists, uh, because what the happens is that they went into this little bay area. Uh, the big ships can't get in, uh, but little ships can. And so because they set up this little small in this area, as you could picture here, there's a lot of forest, which means good for hunting, but not good for farming. And so when winter comes, winter is coming for the colonists, they, can, they were not prepared. And so what happens is that once they run out of foodstuffs and they start living off of hardtack, and when that runs out, uh, food is scarce, uh, your neighbor starts looking very good. Uh, and so what happens is that the colonists revert to eating each other to survive. So cannibalism was the last choice. Now granted the colonial the colonist government did try to stop this uh, after uh, especially after a husband ate his wife and his child. Uh, and so they uh, burned him at the stake uh, to prevent anybody uh, from doing this again. So back to my story. This is not the Disney story of Pocahontas. Uh, if, the, if Disney actually made the actual true story of Jamestown, it would be very, very dark uh, and very, very disturbing. It would give the children nightmares. Uh, now, eventually, Pocahontas' tribe, the uh, Powhatan Nation, named after her father, um, actually took pity on the colonists and actually did try to help them. Uh, they taught them how the colonists how to survive on the land uh, and they also taught the colonists you know how to plant food in the land basically taking fish and using it as fertilizer in the soil because that's how they survived on the land. Eventually Jamestown is going to flourish and eventually what happens is that they will eventually find that the land was perfect for tobacco and they will begin to farm tobacco. This discovery would lead the colonists to become, become very profitable. It would become so profitable that their riches would rival that of the aristocracy that kicked them out of England in the first place. They are richer than the lords and ladies of England and members of parliament. So instead of being low peasants, when some of them return back to England, they think that the aristocracy is going to welcome back them back with open arms. 
Unfortunately, that's not going to happen. The downside to this was that eventually the colonists would need more lands to plant tobacco. And the only lands available to them were their Indian neighbors. Ultimately, what will happen is that Jamestown, so it will go from this to being a gigantic metropolis of a city, or what we would consider a 1600 uh, metropolis. Ultimately, word is going to spread in England that the land and the colonies are perfect for freedom. And so others will eventually come. Some will come for religious freedom. Others will come just to get a new life. And or they see economic opportunity here in the Americas. And so the 13 colonies still are going to evolve. Now typically the 13 colonies at one point was divided up into the its actual true 13 colonies. Historians now have divided it into basically three sections. Right? Uh, three sections of the colony. New England colonies, middle colonies, southern colonies because we classify them this way because each of these contain similarities to the other co co colonies in their region. The New England colonies consist and so this is this map is or this map right here is the New England settlements or colonies from 1620 to 1633. Uh, Plymouth being the first one set up in the New World, mainly uh, by, uh, set up by the Puritans, the famous story. So most of the New England colonies were settled by those seeking religious freedom. So most of these are people who are escaping Europe, uh, escaping New England for the specific purpose of religious freedom. The Puritans themselves even though they are Anglican, they are not fully accepted by the Church of England, who is uh, the Anglican religion. They are a more religious-based uh, group. They believe what the whole truth. They are very fundamentalist in what the Bible teaches, which means they believe the Bible true. The true word by word is true. Uh, they also believe that the government should be ruled by a religious leader. So they believe in a theocracy. Uh, and so basically they believe that the Church of England has fallen, back, uh, fallen away from its true goals. And so uh, they believe it in dressing very plainly, uh, so on and so forth. And so the Church of England didn't like them too much. And so they were persecuted in the New World. Uh, eventually, they were granted the chance to set up a colony in Massachusetts, or what would be present-day Massachusetts, the Massachusetts colony at Plymouth in 1620. Uh, one of the other regions of the New World is the Mill Middle Colony. Uh, the Middle Colony is primarily uh, New um, Nor. Excuse me, North New York, not North New York. And this is the Middle Colonies as of 1700. Uh, there is Pennsylvania, uh, Philadelphia, and Delaware. Ah, interesting story. Interesting story about Pennsylvania. The Indian tribe that uh, William Penn encountered when he set up uh, Pennsylvania actually uh, made a bet with William Penn. William Penn the Indian tribe said, we will give you as much land as one white man can walk. William Penn thing, uh, came up with an idea. A man cannot walk the entire area that is pictured here for Pennsylvania. So what he does is they start over here. Oh, well, well, I don't know exactly where they started, but let's say they started over here. So William Penn and the Indian tribe start over here. They send a man walking. 
a white man walking. Eventually, at certain locations, the Indians had set up, the Indian tribe had set up people to watch for this white man. Uh, and so what happens is that along the way, they set up different men along this route to claim Pennsylvania because here's the problem. A lot of Native Americans at the time believed that all white men looked alike. And so dressing this person uh, up to look like the other guy, the guy who started, William Penn was able to cheat the Native American tribe out of their land. And they being obligated to their bet, they had to give it back. So that's how Pennsylvania became Pennsylvania. But most of the middle colonies are settled by Dutch merchants, especially New York. All right, so people who are making money or want to make money. Uh, and then uh, a lot of settlers are coming uh, over or colonists are coming over for uh, land. There's available, a lot of available land uh, in, the, in the 13 colonies, middle colonies for farming. Uh, and they are also here for religious and political rights. And then there's the southern colonies, Jamestown being one of the first of the southern colonies. Maryland is actually, by the way, set up by Catholics who are escaping England uh, to set up religious freedom in the country. Uh, but Virginia, uh, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia, Georgia are all the southern colonies. Uh, they are primarily an agricultural society which is their main way of life. And eventually their farms will grow so massive that they will have to create indentured servitude uh, or indentured servants. Eventually slave labor did most of the work. Now here's the thing about slave slavery and slave labor. White men did go to Africa to take slaves. Unfortunately, it was not the whites who captured the Native American tribes. It was other African tribes who were getting two things from the whites, guns and gold, uh, in exchange for the people that they uh, took to uh, fight the war. And then they sent them back to uh, the New World as slaves, the captures of the battles. Now, here's the thing. There were actually some former slaves who were freed by their masters uh, who actually became slave holders themselves as well. Uh, so a little side note about the southern colonies. Eventually plantations will be created in the southern colonies and it will be the types of, uh, of you know buildings and homes that you would see in the movies. But the 13 colonies are set up the uh, at, for England and it sets the stage for something that will change the world forever because what will happen here is that eventually as the generation after generation after generation is born in the new world that gap between home country and uh, colony is going to grow even wider. Eventually you have people here in the new world who think themselves better and richer than some of their as the aristocracy in England. And like I said before, when they go back to England, unfortunately what's going to happen is that they will not be accepted. And so it just causes a bigger rift uh, between the colonists and the crown and the government of England. Uh, and so it will lay the stage. So what we had, what they have done is they have laid the stage or laid out the stage for the American Revolution. England is finding, as other countries, that establishing a presence in North America has its challenges. 
one major change going at the beginning of the 17th century is that London is starting to get interested in overseas colonies. And uh, that means that London merchants are willing to invest in it. And by now, they have invented something very close to the modern corporation, where you can buy shares, pool the resources of a lot of different people. And the Virginia Company Charter of 1606 is the first major example of that. They do raise an enormous amount of money, several hundred thousand pounds uh, in 20 years' time. And they do just barely manage to get a colony which survives all of the trials of those first couple of decades. What we think of as colonization is incredibly expensive. And England was poor enough that all such enterprises had to be done by private enterprise. So I think what they were hoping for was a trading post or a post for privateering and other kinds of activities. It's what the French were beginning to establish in the St. Lawrence. Colonization was something that they went into when they found that there was no other way to have an American presence and make it pay. And I think they did it reluctantly. The London Company's second colony is established at Jamestown, an inland location they think will be easier to defend. If you were to look at the very early phase of migration, the migration to the Chesapeake, there are uh, some people well, whom John Smith, for instance, called adventurers and footmen, uh, guys with a, and I do mean guys, <laughs> with uh, an eye on the main chance, people who wanted to make a quick kind of buck, get in and out. Uh, with any luck, they would be able to find gold or some other kind of immediately extractable substance. Some of the leading colonists were the younger sons of gentry and nobility families who wanted to secure wealth and status in a new world which they were not going to get in the old world because that was going to go to their older brothers. And you can see in Jamestown, they spend the first decade trying to get by without sending large numbers of people. And then it's only when that clearly has failed that there's no treasure immediately to be picked up. I mean, you can't sell enough sarsaparilla or, <laughs> or sassafras to make this kind of connection pay that they began to think in terms of setting up true communities or colonies of people in America from the old world. The London Company, now calling itself the Virginia Company, obtains a new charter in 1609 and offers incentives to anyone willing to migrate. 600 people, among them women and children, depart for Virginia in the spring. Many of the colonists were indentured servants who couldn't pay their way across the Atlantic, who entered service for a period of several years in order to pay their way in the hope of attaining some kind of economic security. Some of the original settlers had no real intentions of staying in the New World in the South. They hoped that they would either get rich or at least secure a competency and then go back. So about a quarter of the people in the 17th century who go to the Chesapeake went as free people who paid their own way. Three quarters went as indentured servants. These were the people who were in the greatest demand because the people who owned farms and plantations in the Chesapeake could get more work out of them. The assumption was that because this was primarily an economic enterprise that male workers would be preferable to female workers and so the gender ratio was very skewed at first, six men for every one woman. Also, these would be the people who would be more willing to take the risks, the considerable risks of going across the Atlantic and living in this new colony, a gamble that a lot of them lost. We could say that before 1650, most of them lost. They didn't live long enough to become free. There's a letter by a man named John Freethorne who was sent by his parents as a servant to Virginia, which has been preserved in the Virginia Company records, in which he essentially says, if you had known what you were sending me into, you would not have sent me here. Sort of basically, get me out of here. He says, you have turned away a beggar at your door with more than I get in a week to eat here. The South was a death trap. I mean, people were dropping like flies during the first few years. And at one point, things got so bad, both from the point of view of disease and from the point of view of their suffering from malaria and other diseases, that one winter over half of the colonists died. And there is some evidence to suggest that people were digging up corpses and eating them, and it, things got pretty bad. 
Within ten days, scarce ten among us could either go or will stand. Such extreme weakness and sickness oppressed us. And thereat none need marvel if they consider the cause and the reason, which was this. While the ships stayed, our allowance was somewhat bettered by a daily proportion of biscuit, which the sailors would pilfer to sell, give, or exchange with us for money, sassafras, furs, or love. But when they departed, our president allowed equally to be distributed half a pint of wheat and as much barley boiled with water for a man a day. And this having fried some 26 weeks in the ship's hold, contained as many worms as grains. But now was all our provision spent, the sturgeon gone, all helps abandoned, each hour expecting the fury of the savages, when God, the patron of all good endeavors, in that desperate extremity, so changed the hearts of the savages, that they brought such plenty of their fruits and provision as no man wanted. In the early going at Jamestown, in the Jamestown settlement, it is clear, I think, that the European settlers in Jamestown would not have made it through the winter as they did were it not for the example of Indians' own agriculture and gifts of food from Indians. Corn, in particular, is considered a miracle crop. And the way the natives grew it, planting beans and having the beans then use the corn stalks for support was uh, extremely productive because the, the beans actually put nitrogen into the soil so that they were fertilizing the corn through this device and English cultivators who thought that that looked sloppy and who grew the corn in this field and the beans in this field could never figure out why their yield was so much lower than the Indians yield. As volatile as their relationship often was, why were Native Americans so supportive? There's no question that they could have halted colonization in the early years. And without that Indian help, they would never have been able to establish themselves, even in the limited way that they did. So why did the Indians extend this aid? And the answer seems to be that the Indian leaders who were nearest the settlements, that is, Wingina in Roanoke and Powhatan in Virginia, understood that if they could become the conduits for European goods into the interior, that that would enhance their power. Edmund Morgan, a long time ago, wrote an article entitled something like The Paradox of Jamestown. In the provocations leading up to and then following the 1622 massacre, Jamestown settlers literally bit or killed the hands that were feeding them. They attacked the Indians, they burned the cornfields, and they left themselves in a state of real desperation. So part of what Morgan asked was why would people behave in such an obviously self-destructive and counterproductive way? A large part of his answer was that one thing that the Europeans really counted on heavily and that they held dear was a sense of cultural superiority, that they were civilized, they were Christian, they would be the benevolent uh, patrons of the area around them. And the circumstances in which they found themselves were not ones that would make you feel that everything was going well. It was, and the investors were putting a tremendous amount of pressure on the people in Jamestown to start producing profits. So these settlers find themselves dying off, things aren't going their way, and it turns out that their much vaunted superiority over the Indians is also not being borne out, and that part of their response was a kind of a cultural retribution. So eventually, like I said, after the colonies are set up, the Native Americans are pretty much pushed back into uh, the un well, what you would they discovered or what they called the undiscovered region. Um, they set up great amount of colonies in the thirteen colonies, but uh, what will eventually happen is that the divide between my home country here in England and the colonies is going to be divided by a generation but the Atlantic Ocean and so thus in 
the 1700s, the late 1700s, permit particularly 1775, uh, the American Revolution will begin.